Hey there, my name is Terry with True Marie Soapworks, and today I'm showing you this Taiwan swirl design. I made this design a while back, and I'm just now getting to the video editing of it, so thank you for some of you who have been very patient with me. This video also features a custom craft tools soap cutter that I kind of collaborated on the making of it, although they took it to higher heights than I could have ever imagined. If you've seen some of my older soap making videos, you have seen me use a different cutter to cut horizontally and vertically. And also I have a different cutter to cut my thin slab mold designs. And then I also had another cutter to cut my thicker slab mold designs. So that was four different cutting stations. Each one of those cutting stations had its own limitations and that was the reason why I needed the four different cutters. Well, here we've solved all those problems or actually custom craft tools has solved all those problems. This cutter is a cutter that I would have wanted to have in the beginning. Stay tuned for more information and I have a discount code for you and more specific examples on the limitations of the other cutters and why this one has replaced all of them. Thank you so much for joining me. Let's get to it. To start with, I prepare the lye solution. For the water, I use distilled water ice cubes for one third to one half of the water weight. I do that because it cuts down on the fumes and it also helps the lye solution cool more quickly. After I add the ice cubes, I top off the remaining water weight. Then I measure the sodium hydroxide. If you're new to soap making, you should know that sodium hydroxide is caustic and it's very dangerous. You need to treat it with respect and learn all the proper safety precautions before handling it. Next, I add the sodium hydroxide to the water. I stir it right away. I want to make sure that none of it settles to the bottom and forms a crust. Just so you know, all soap is made with lye, whether it's sodium or potassium hydroxide. Even melt and pour is originally made with lye, so you can't make soap without it. If you're worried though, there is no lye left over in the final soap because all soap is super fatted. Technology has come a long way to understand what the saponification rates are for the different oils that are added. So that's all figured out and there's always an excess of oils so there won't be any lye left over. Here I'm measuring the sodium lactate so I can set that aside with my cooling lye solution. I put the lye solution in a well ventilated area that's safe from any kids or pets. Next, I measure the coconut oil and the palm oil, and I microwave that until it's just barely melted, but completely melted. The contents of the bowl should be clear. In the meantime, I start to measure out my liquid oils, starting with the castor oil and then the olive oil. Next, I measure out the cocoa butter and the mango seed butter. I'm getting that ready to stir into the melted coconut and palm oil. Next, I measure the fragrance into the liquid oils. You can use any fragrance that is slow moving. After I measured the fragrance, I added one teaspoon per pound of oils of the kaolin clay, and I set that aside and let that sink down to the bottom. For this batch, the colors I picked were kind of a yellow green with a turquoise and then also black and white. The yellow green was a combination of a green mica and a yellow neon. And the turquoise was a combination of that same green mica with a blue neon. I hesitate to name the colors here because these are Elements Bath & Body colors. As many of you know, I did some testing for Elements Bath & Body, so I have their colorants and I know their colorants. But now Elements Bath & Body no longer exists. It was bought by the parent company of Wholesale Supplies Plus called Indie Made Brands. At the moment, you can still get this green mica on the Wholesale Supplies Plus website. It's called Green with Envy Mica. I compared this green with MV Mica to a mica that I have from Nurture Soap called Jade Mica. It is exactly the same down to the ingredients, including the Florflogopite. Florflogopite is a synthetic mica, and not many micas use that. So I believe these probably came from the same source and they're the same thing. So if you happen to have Jade Mica from Nurture Soap, that would be the same thing. 
I used a blue neon and a yellow neon. You can get those at any reputable soap supply company. They're pretty much the same across the board. They either have a base or filler or carrier that is polyester 3 or polyurethane 11, and then they have the pigment, which in the case of the blue is ultramarine blue, and the yellow is yellow 5. To get these two greens to be a little more different than they are now, I decided to add a little more yellow neon to the yellow green. Before we get too far, I want to let you know that I made my own set of dividers. So if you're interested in making your own set of dividers, they would have to be done ahead of time. I have a video showing how to do that. For this set of dividers that I made, I made seven compartments. So that would require eight of the long pieces. I could have also done it with five compartments. We'll talk a little bit more about the math and dividing the batter later on. For black colorant, I love to use activated charcoal. I tend to like the activated charcoal best that is from coconut carbon and not hardwood, but you could use either. I use it at a rate of one and a half teaspoons per pound of soap, or that's pretty close to two teaspoons per pound of oils. I'm also using titanium dioxide, but I have already dispersed that at one part titanium dioxide to three parts olive oil. And then I use a colorant calculator to figure out how much dispersed titanium dioxide I need for the amount of white batter that I'm using. Now that the coconut oil and palm oil are completely melted and clear, I go ahead and stir in the cocoa butter and mango butter. I stir that until it's melted. If it doesn't melt from the residual heat, I go ahead and very gently microwave that. I am very delicate with my butters. Now that the clay has fallen to the bottom, this is a great time to stick blend the clay and incorporate it very well. You don't have to worry about acceleration because this is just the oils. Keep in mind that with this type of design, you need time to work, so you need a slow moving recipe. It can be any slow moving recipe. I have shared a lot of slow moving recipes in the description of some of my older videos, so check those out. I also have many slow moving recipes up for sale on my website that includes the measurements in grams and ounces. Of course, there are other factors that go into keeping your recipe from accelerating, but having a slow moving recipe will start you off on the right foot. When I'm satisfied that I have the clay mixed well, I go ahead and add that mixture to the melted hard oils. I soap between temperatures of 85 and 95 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 29 to 35 degrees Celsius. At this point, I add the sodium lactate to the cooled lye solution, and then I strain that into the oils. Now it's time to calculate the amount of batter that I need to split off. And I'm not worried about calculating the white batter because that's just whatever's left over. But basically, I'm using one seventh of the batter for the middle three colors. To figure out the weight of the batter that's in the bowl, I have to weigh the bowl and the contents, and then I subtract off the weight of the bowl that I recorded earlier, and I get the weight of the contents. And then to figure out that weight that I want to use for the middle three compartments, I just divide that number by seven. Here, I did it a little longer way, and I multiplied that by 14.3%, which is the percentage of one seventh. Now that we know the weight of the batter that we're going to split off for those three middle compartments, we go ahead and stick blend the batter till an emulsion is reached. An emulsion is before trace, but it's when everything is mixed together completely. A good way to tell if it's emulsified is if you can't see that slick of oils that appears around the edge of the bowl. Also, if you look at the bell of the stick blender, when it's emulsified, it looks like a thin, even film. It doesn't look grainy. It doesn't look kind of like applesauce. It doesn't split apart. It doesn't show the bell of the stick blender. You don't see any of that stainless steel showing through. And the reason you only get it to an emulsion is that you need time to work. You need time to color the batter and you need time to get it into the mold in between those divisions and that takes a little time and while you're working your batter will be getting thicker. And for that reason I was very delicate with my stick blending. I would stick blend a little and then I would stir it by hand and stick blend a little and stir it by hand. I was just wanting to get it to the point that it's emulsified because if it's not emulsified it can separate so you don't want that but you still want it very thin so you can get it in between those compartments. 
And if you notice that once you've colored your batter, it's still extremely thin, like too thin, and not traced at all, that's the point where you wait on it. You just stir it by hand and it will thicken up. It's important to be patient at this stage. If you go in there and stick blend, you're probably going to get it too thick, so just be patient. All right, it's at the stage that I like. So I'm splitting off the batter into those three pitchers and then the remaining will be the white. As I mentioned before, this is dispersed one part titanium dioxide to three parts of olive oil. And then I used a rate of one teaspoon per pound of oils. Here all the colorants are in the batter and I just stir them in until they're mixed well. Notice that the greens are still true, but as they are exposed to the batter for a little longer, they start to morph. It seems that in soap making, each color family has its little quirks. And the quirk with green is that with green micas, the colors morph. They get a little more olivey or drab in tone, but they do morph back. Many times they end up liking the morphed greens better than the actual greens, and that was the case here. They turned into kind of a olive and a sage color, and to me I preferred those colors rather than how they ended up, so that's something to strive for next time. I added a little bit of dispersed titanium dioxide to each of these greens to make them a little bit brighter. They would stand out a little more from the black. It probably wasn't necessary. It's really hard to judge the colors right now because of the morphed green. Here's a shot of my prepared mold. I have a 10 inch silicone mold with the dividers I mentioned earlier, and I also made some guides out of graph paper for the edges so that I can make my swirl pattern very uniform. Notice that because the batter is so thin, some of the batter does go underneath the dividers, which is to be expected. The goal when you begin to pour is just to pour enough into each of the compartments to seal them off, enough to cover the bottom. Then after that, you don't have to worry about the batter oozing under as much. It's best to try to evenly fill each of the compartments rather than filling them all the way to the top. Sometimes the weight of that can cause it to push under the other compartments as well. The white goes in the outer two compartments on each side. Earlier I mentioned I could have got by with doing five compartments, but if you're using this for something else that you want to use for seven colors, then it's best just to do it this way. But if you're making it specifically for this design, you can omit those dividers between the two whites. If you're noticing that some of the batter is ending up in the wrong compartments, don't worry about that. You can fix that. After you get everything in the mold, if you run a skewer back and forth and mix what's in each of the compartments, it makes the little mess ups pretty much unnoticeable. It also loosens up the batter and makes it swirl more readily. Now it's time to remove the dividers. You can see that it's a little tricky. You have to break the suction. And if I didn't have the two sides on my dividers, it would be a little easier to remove the dividers, but I like to have those sides on there just to make it more of a closed system. Otherwise, the color often flows around the ends of the dividers and I don't really like that. So it's whatever you prefer. You can see that the batter is a little uneven. To fix this, I just bang the mold down on the countertop and that evens things out a bit. For the swirl pattern, to start with, plunge your swirl tool all the way to the bottom in one of the far corners and drag it along the short side of that end. Once you reach the opposite end of the mold, pivot 90 degrees and move your tool ever so slightly. Here I just move it a quarter of an inch and then return to the opposite end and move it a quarter of an inch and continue this pattern all the way to the end. This is when those guides that I made really came in handy. I said in my mind, blue, blue, purple, purple, blue, blue, purple, purple, and that kept me on track throughout the whole swirl. Now that you've reached the end, pivot the mold 90 degrees and make a swipe with the swirl tool down the center. If you're happy with the design at this point, you can stop. I chose to do two more passes in the opposite direction. By dragging out the line like this, it makes it more thin at the end, and so it varies the line thickness, and that causes more interest, and it also conveys a sense of motion, which makes a more visually pleasing design.
In the end, I also made two swipes with a skewer along each edge. This didn't really impact the design. It just cleaned up the edge of the mold a bit. After that, I do a little more tidying of the edge, and then I leave it open to the air until it loses its shine. At that point, I cover it loosely and oven process it. I speak about oven processing in several of my videos, so I'm not going to go into it here. Keep in mind the color of the batter, and as you see here, the morphed color of the greens. It will morph back, and just notice the difference as I'm cutting the soap. As I said earlier, I'm just getting to editing this video, and I made this soap quite a long time ago. This cutter was new to me. This is called the Caterpillar Soap Cutting Station, and it's from Custom Craft Tools. Right now I'm using it to split this loaf horizontally. You can adjust the wire in increments of an eighth of an inch, and so the lowest one can be an eighth of an inch, and the highest increments all the way up to four and a half inches. In the past to do this, I had another tool called a soap slicer, and it was similar to this, only the bar of the wire cutter was across the top, which caused problems because it limited you on the height of something you could pass through there. You couldn't use it on slab mold designs. Now this has solved that. I can push my slab mold designs through this easily, and it's so easy to adjust. It takes literally seconds to go from cutting horizontally to vertically. For this loaf, I used the horizontal cutting feature twice. I first passed it through at the one inch height, and then I passed it through at the two inch height so that these bars would be even and so they would fit in my boxes. Next, I marked the divisions to cut these into bars. This is a 10 inch mold, so you can make five bars for each of these pieces and a total of 10 bars by doing two inch divisions. But I like to cut a little off the end because those are usually a little messed up anyway. And I like the look of having my bars a little taller. The proportions seem more pleasing. So I go with two and a fourth inches instead of the two inch bars and that makes eight bars total. The example that I just showed you, I had to use the one tool to cut it horizontally, and then I had to use the other cutting station to cut it vertically. And for this one, all you do is slide out that wire tool and turn it around 180, and you have your vertical cutting surface. It's that easy. Another tool that I've been able to partially replace with this tool is my planer. I can't fully replace it because this tool is not good for planing off really thin surfaces. Sometimes the top of the loaf mold designs will be at a bit of an angle, which is unintentional most of the time. And when you use a planer to plane that off, you're still going to have the same angle. But with this, I can pass it through and get it squared up. Also, because this cutter can cut such thin horizontal slices, you can use this to make frame soaps. A while back, I used this to make a frame for my abstract soap for a blind soap challenge, and it really made it stand out as art. It really created quite a statement. I have a full video of this abstract art soap. If you're interested, please check the description. By having this one cutting station and having it perform so many different functions, I was able to free up so much space in my cabinet, and that alone is very valuable. Space is valuable. Another thing about this cutter is the quality. You can see that here. It's above and beyond. It's like they thought of everything. One thing I didn't like about a lot of my cutters before is that you had to use them over the edge of a table, like to push away from the edge of the table so that it didn't move. This cutter has very grippy feet, so it's not set up to work over the edge of a table. Full disclosure, one thing I did change about this is I actually replaced the wire with a thinner wire. I think the wire for this one is a 0.022 and I replaced it with a 0.016 and the cut is cleaner. So that's one thing you may want to consider, but the 0.022 would be the stronger of the two. Since I got this cutting station, I have gotten a multi-cutter to try it out, and I still love this cutting station better. The multi-cutter cuts up to 18 bars, which is great, but I don't like the cuts. I'm not happy with them. Plus, the cleanup is a lot more. You have to get down in each one of those grooves to get all those little soap pieces out that get dragged. So I've resorted to just using that 18-bar cutter to mark my cuts, and then I go to this one to cut. To summarize, this cutting station from Custom Craft Tools is in the long run cheaper than buying several different cutting stations to perform the different functions that you need. By buying this, you only have to buy one cutting station and you only have to clean one cutting station and you only have to store one cutting station. 
and also the quality is superior to any of those other cutting stations that I showed you. Wood eventually breaks down, like the cutting edge of my other cutter eventually got worn and I had to put something on there so it would still cut a straight line. Well, this one's not going to wear out like that. I have been using this cutter for over two years now, so I'm very familiar with it. So if there's anything that I didn't cover about this and you still have questions, please just drop them in the comments below and I'll get back to you on that. Now let's talk about what I learned from this batch. Since I used a silicone mold for this and the bottom is not rigid, I could have put something underneath like a folded towel and when I hold down on the dividers, I could have got better contact and had less of that batter oozing underneath the compartments. I'm really happy with how the design came out, but I'm still not happy with the colors. To me, they lack sophistication. After seeing the morphed colors that were more olivey and sage, I really fell in love with those. I would also love to explore more earthy tones with this, and so instead of doing the black in the center, do a darker color of any earthy color, and then a more subtle color. That would be more attractive and sophisticated. Another thing that usually happens in all of these horizontal type of designs where you swirl, the design looks very different from the top to the bottom. It can't really be avoided, but something with a little more drag could help. In the past, I've used a stick called a skinny stick that you can buy at craft stores. I've used it in some of my other videos with good results, so that would be a thing I could try. Another thing that I would consider for next time is making this with only five cavities instead of seven. Seven it gets to be pretty thin and it's hard to pour into and if your batter thickens then you're dealing with trying to get the batter out of these really thin compartments. A lot of it sticks to the dividers and it's just a mess. So I would just go ahead and use only five cavities instead of seven. Thank you for watching. I hope you learned something. And if you have any questions or comments, please drop them below. I have included more information in the description about things I have talked about throughout this video, including the Caterpillar cutting station from Custom Craft Tools. I wanted a cutter to be able to recommend to you all, and the ones I had all had shortfalls and reasons why I couldn't recommend them. That is the cutter that I wish I had in the beginning. So in the description, I have the link and also a discount code. If you're new and you haven't subscribed and you would like to catch my next video, please subscribe and I will see you back here next time.